Welcome, friends. This is Historical AF. I'm Keena. And I'm Nick. We are a historian and a special guest here to deliver the funny and morbid historical nuggets you never need needed in your ear holes. This is Spies Part 1. Da, da, da. <laughs> I was trying to, I completely forgot the James Bond theme for a second. I blanked. Or Mission Impossible. I could have gone with anything. and I. I Mission Impossible it. would have been good. Way to go, Pasquina. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm really excited that you're here because you're the closest thing to a spy I know in real life. <laughs> it's perfect for you. I'm glad so, to be here. Tell everybody about yourself, all your secrets. <laughs> all my secrets. <laughs> I actually got a memo that I have to shorten my intro. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Nick. I am a retired Central Intelligence Agency field officer with the Special Activities Division. I started in the military at 17. I went into intelligence. I transferred into counterintelligence, and then I went to Special Forces all the selection training for that. When I was assigned to a team, I was started as a weapon sergeant, and then I went into the intelligence division, my ODA. From there, I was selected to join ISA, which is Intelligence Support Activity, which officially doesn't exist. Um, so it's it's a little bit hard to prove that you were or were not in these things because you technically don't exist while you're in them. So from ISA, I was recruited into the Central Intelligence Agency Special Activity Center, and I have worked for them for about nine years, and I retired in 2019 from the field. I'm still on their reserve roster, apparently. So, Wow. I didn't even know there was a reserve. So if you're active, you're a field officer. If you're a consultant, if you're a contractor, you're technically reserved. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Maybe I've just always heard it as contractor, and I don't know the difference of these things. I'm just a silly civilian. <laughs> I know not of the top secret things. I just know the things I'm not allowed to talk about. And then my mom asked questions. I'm like, mom, I can't answer anything. And she's like, why? I'm like, we're on the phone, mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mom spent about 10 years of, where are you? I can't tell you. You just don't want to tell me. Who is oh, she? No. <laughs> I, like, no, really, mom, I can't tell you. <laughs> Oh, that's got to be so difficult. Or she well, would send she would send me links to articles of things exploding, and she'd be like, "Was this you? Did you do this?" <laughs> no, I couldn't tell you if it was. <laughs> Did you do this? <laughs> so, so she knows you well. <laughs> she does. She does. She knows my shenanigans. That's incredible. I can imagine that would be really, really difficult to not know where your person's at, you know, whether it be a child or a significant other and stuff. I've been lucky. I've been able to know where Zeke's at. I usually don't know the specifics until afterwards. And then he yeah. will tell me. So I'm terrified. <laughs> Anxiety. I yeah. was married for nine years. And after the first deployment that I couldn't tell her any more than the country I was going to, that went downhill real fast. So I can imagine it would be a lot of stress. You guys are the real ones because not only is it an incredibly stressful job that has to be terrifying at times, oh, it's it <laughs> a strain on literally every single aspect of your life. There's so much even afterwards that you can't tell your family, you can't tell friends, you can't, you have to go back and smile and be like, that business conference was really stressful. I'm going to take three days off. Yeah, it must feel like splitting yourself in two. Like being two different people that cannot be healthy. Oh, ISA is fun because when I joined, it was called Cemetery Wind. And once you're selected and you get through all the training, they create what they call a legend for you, which is literally your new identity. And they kind of shelf your other one. So when I transferred into special activities, they didn't give me my old identity back, so I still just kind of float along with the other one while they put the other parts back in place. Oh, wow. So if you come home after an extended period of time and you have to get a job, you have to get credit cards, you apply for a mortgage, they're like, you don't have a credit history. Oh, like, no. I've been paying on my credit cards for 20 years. Fuck you. <laughs> That's insane. You know, movies got it all wrong. They make it look so glamorous being a spy, but it oh. just be a, them coming home, you're like, God damn it, I do have credit. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, James Bond has an apartment and a car, and he doesn't have any problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It must well, be nice. Then, well, then also we run into things in <laughs> history where some people have lived their whole lives, have done incredible things you know, for their country and they could ever tell even their spouses or their children and nobody knows like that must suck. Especially if you get frustrated being like, you need to respect me. You have no idea what I did in that war. <laughs> You're lucky uh, to be here. Yeah. My mom's 
parents both held top secret clearances during World War II. And my mom was a bot. My mom's mom was a botanist. And then she was she had two degrees. She was botany and chemistry. So I'm not really sure what she worked on. She didn't talk about it. She just collected knickknacks. But my mom's dad was really adamant that he never, ever, ever talked about it, except that he was involved with the atomic bomb projects. Oh. And it wasn't until he was old and dementia sat in, sank in, that he really opened up that he worked for the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. Yeah. And they, he was a, an engineer. So they recruited him to work alongside the German scientists to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing and not selling out secrets. And it must have been extremely stressful because he held that secret until the week before he died. Oh, wow. But once I knew what he did, I could go back in the archives and find out, you know, how he was recruited, the schooling that he did, all the reports that he made. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to make a like little book and give it to my mom. And they were like, ah, 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 no, you don't. Like, um. <laughs> Has a lot of that been declassified by now or is it all still very hush hush? They declassified a bunch of it. They recently declassified a bunch of the UFO encounter stuff, but mm-hmm. there's so much redaction on it. You're, it's not worth filling out the forms to try and get any of it. They're <laughs> like, right. we're going to give you, they tease you with a the breadcrumb. They're like, UFOs exist. We think at least maybe it might've been Russians. You know, with, with the podcast, the joke is always like it was it's the aliens didn't build the pyramids mm-hmm. and the joke in the CIA. It's, it's not the Russians. It's <laughs> always the Russians <laughs> who may have been aliens that built the pyramids. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> when in doubt, blame Russian aliens. There we go. Russian aliens. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from the comments from a Jolly J. <laughs> <laughs> they just go flying around going, suck your bleat. <laughs> I will tell you, I was thrilled to death because when I asked you to guest for this mm-hmm. episode, you were talking about the very few things you're allowed to talk about. <laughs> they, they hand you a, a pamphlet and they're like, these are the things that you can talk about. And then they hand you a 17th century Bible oh, that's, and yeah, weighs 300 pounds. And they're like, and if you mention any of these things, you can possibly go to prison for the rest of your life. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not included in that, right? No. Okay. <laughs> Too nice to go to jail. I signed all the security releases that I would not say anything that could possibly put anybody else in danger, wow. much less myself. So sweet. The podcast would... must go on, even if I have to listen behind bars. So. <laughs> I know I would not fare well in prison. I already know that about myself. <laughs> Just cry a lot. It would not be great. I might be tall and intimidating, but I am not <laughs> <laughs> far from it. <laughs> Oh, man. So we want to just jump into some spy shit? Hell yes. Let's do it. All right. So I'm going to kick it off with Morbid, and then you're going to finish this off with some funny stuff. So, Lord help me, this segment will be a lot of French, and we all know how well I am at speaking French. But I have waited this entire podcast life to talk about this person, and I am so excited. She's a personal hero of mine, and I'm going to geek the fuck out. Yes. Yes. Just jump right into it. A true story of art war and an unassuming spy and also anytime you feel the urge to boo nazis go for it oh, always always boo the nazis or punch a nazi like <laughs> glorious <laughs> bastards <laughs> we're gonna start this out with a pretty chonky historical detour because i want to set the stage give it a little context but it's gonna get really dark and then then we'll have like a little glimmer of hope of humanity you know some hope at the end so stick with me <laughs> All right. World War I was horrific and devastating. We all know they called it the war to end all wars because people honestly thought nothing worse could happen. We've seen it all. Nobody's ever going to let this happen again. That didn't happen. It actually, by most accounts of historians, led directly to World War II. And don't get me wrong, there's a ton of reasons for this war. But a lot of the biggies were a direct result of World War I. For example, a worldwide economic depression, shrank economies, reduced trade, closed businesses. While prices fell, banks failed, and unemployment was insane. And sometimes when you're in a depression, people look for strong political leaders to resolve their problems. Never underestimate what people will do or believe to feed their families. Makes me sad. Okay, so next we have the Treaty of Versailles. After World War I, the Allied powers met to decide Germany's fate, and they went hard on her. 
They made the new government, which was the Weimar Republic at the time, sign a treaty that forced them to accept guilt, pay reparations, which was like $33 million, give up territory, and then lose their military. One British official exclaimed, quote, we shall squeeze the German lemon until the pips squeak. The most British <laughs> shit ever, but an idea of just like, we are going to punish you and then punish you some more and fuck you. And of I'm course, a good, good harumph in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, this is a huge blow to the country. Mm. Paying reparations destabilized their economy, and inflation was insane. By September 1923, 4 billion German marks was equal to 1 American dollar. Wow. <laughs> yeah. According to the National World War II Museum, quote, consumers needed a wheelbarrow to carry enough paper money to buy a loaf of bread. Things are great. I can't yeah. imagine that was enjoyable. So Germany was humiliated in the ruins from war. They're hungry. They're angry. And you can kind of see why people are open at this point to follow a political leader that's promising to restore Germany to her greatness. Yeah, it's just primed and ready for the anthropomorphized bag of dicks, Hitler. <laughs> and by all accounts, he was charismatic. Oh. Sociopath. <laughs> and... Quote, a mesmerizing public speaker. So and Rasputin. Yeah, yeah. All <laughs> these sociopaths, they're so good with people, unfortunately. <laughs> and he's saying all the right things. And he is just skyrocketing to power. Also, he's trash. And I don't want to say his name. So I'm replacing all his names in this story with insults. So reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And I asked <laughs> Patreon to help me with some of these. <laughs> so there's a nice hefty list of insults. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so the douche canoe was appointed to Chancellor of Germany in 1933 following a series of electoral victories by the n- victories. Victories by the Nazi Party. A party, by the way, that he forged following his return from World War I alongside other Germans that were equally outraged and humiliated by the Treaty of Versailles. Almost immediately, the single bald bitch cake dismantled Germany's democratic institutions and started imprisoning and or murdering his chief opponents. Not that there's anything wrong with having one ball. I'm not being ableist here. I just think it's a fun fact and it might show up on a trivia night. When President Hindenburg died the following year, the Twat Waffle took the title of Fuhrer, Chancellor, and Commander-in-Chief of the Army. <laughs> I'm going to try to sound as professional as I possibly can as I say things I'm like sorry, Twat I Waffle. Love this. I love this too much. <laughs> I had a lot of fun writing this. <laughs> I just, I, I've gotten to a point in my historical career where I'm just like, fuck that guy. I don't want to say his name anymore. He doesn't deserve it. He gets to be a twat. Fuck him. I know. (laughs) So, (laughs) oh, the insults are still coming in the comments. That's incredible. (laughs) 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 So I'll use one. The cuck fuck expanded the army, reintroduced conscription, and began developing a new air force. These were all major violations of the Treaty of Versailles, but the world still fearing another world war let it slide until it was just too late. Isn't there a good quote? I'm not sure how it goes, but it's like for evil to flourish, good men just have to do nothing. Yeah. That's, that's uh, I don't know if that came out of that, but that that totally applies to that situation. They oh, could, absolutely. They could have shut that shit down at any time and they were just like, yeah, do you want to poke the bear? Because here, here's the stick and somebody else just passed the stick and then it fell on the ground and they were like, hey, there's yeah. a stick. We should poke the bear. And yeah. by then the bear was busy shitting on Poland. So Exactly. What would follow would be a second world war that would claim over 70 million lives, including an estimated 17 million people who were murdered by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. This genocide, known as the Holocaust, murdered approximately 6 million Jews, 5.7 million Soviet civilians, 3 million Soviet prisoners of war, 1.8 million Polish civilians, 312,000 Serbian civilians, 250,000 institutionalized or disabled people, 250,000 Sinti or Roma minorities, 70,000 repeat criminal offenders and or undesirables, end quote, 3,000 homosexuals, and 1,900 Jehovah's Witnesses, approximately. That is a fact I didn't know. Yes. And calculating these totals is really, really difficult. There's no single wartime document 
known to history at this point that spells out how many people were actually killed in the Holocaust or World War II. To accurately estimate the extent of human loss, scholars, Jewish organizations, and government agencies since 1940 have relied on a variety of different records, like census reports, captured German and Axis archives, and post-war investigations to compile these statistics. Mm -hmm. As more documents come to light or scholars arrive at a more precise understanding of the Holocaust, estimates of this loss is going to change. So in the future, if somebody's listening to this and you're like, oh, the numbers are different, that's probably why. But this was the most up-to-date from this year, 2021. And there's been a lot more research in the area of like homosexuality and a lot of the other minorities that were murdered as well. Mm -hmm. So people are coming up with more numbers because they're finding uh, more documentation. So really tragic, really sad, so many lives. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Holocaust museum, but I've never witnessed Mm -hmm. anything so tragic like the air gets sucked out of the room when you walk in it's 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 rough yeah it's a crime against humanity a genocide and also it's really important i know when people talk about the holocaust sometimes it kind of comes off like it's the only time this has happened there's been genocide there's genocides happening in our lifetimes constantly so it's important to always remember that all right so detour over (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. I, I know it was a long one, but I just, again, <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge the victims of World War II. And I also wanted there to be a good understanding about the world we're walking into right now. So we're going to rewind back to when World War II was brewing, was not quite declared. The fuck knuckle is dismantling democracy. He's launching attacks on art and culture as well. You see this dingle hop and shit stain. I don't remember who gave me that one, but it's a good one. <laughs> Kudos to them. <laughs> Had been an artist before he was a soldier or a politician, and he was really into realism, specifically buildings and landscapes. Unfortunately for him, realism was out, and abstract and modern styles were in. Mm. So when the shit whistle applied to art school in Vienna, his ass got rejected, and he never let it go. I just, I mean, if you've ever seen Hitler's art, okay, you can draw a building, but he's not like fantastic or anything have you ever seen his paintings <laughs> i have it wasn't like spectacular or anything so enter the degenerate art exhibition and this mustachio man child trying to get revenge this was essentially a political gimmick to destroy art that didn't fit his ideals or propaganda machine which included a lot of art by jewish artists and also modern art which he had a huge grudge about because how dare they not like his shit In 1937, 740 modern works were exhibited in a defamatory show called the Degenerate Art Show in Munich. And it was essentially created to educate the public on the art of decay. Oh, it's wild. So these exhibitions were intended to mock art and the artists. They were designed to encourage a bad reaction and they wanted people to start getting angry or start making fun of. It was to create a reaction. So even the the panels were just making fun of the people or calling parallels between that kind of art and mental illness. Like it was horrifying. Afterwards, most of these paintings were destroyed unless they were deemed marketable internationally. And if they were, then they were sold through sellers on behalf of the German government. So that's why things like the MoMA has a lot of this art, because they swooped in and took it when it came up for sale. Unfortunately, a lot of art has been burned. And, oh, we don't even know how many things are just missing or destroyed, but this was the beginning of it. Now we are officially in World War II and the Nazis are advancing across Europe. They're wreaking havoc and destruction. And simultaneously, they're facilitating one of the most devastating art thefts in history. Yes, this cock weasel had ordered that all cultural centers, museums, galleries, and private collections be plundered by his regime for this fucked up vision he had. What vision, you might ask? Well... He wanted a big-ass museum with his fucking name on it. Oh, I hate this guy. So he wanted to say Fuhrer Museum. And it was supposed to be this massive thing that was going to have a cultural center surrounding it. Which, the idea that you are literally decimating every culture you come in contact with, but you want to have a cultural center, just... It, the rage. Yes, true. <laughs> the rage. 
<laughs> and it was only to be filled what he deemed worthy. So again, he's pissed off at people that didn't like his art, and he thinks that his style and things that he wants to be German, you know, is the only things worthy. And essentially, he wanted to fill this giant building with all the priceless stolen art he had collected, and then also feature commissions from artists that he picked to be the art of the Third Reich. Everything else was to be destroyed. If anybody's ever taken an art history class, there'll be... There'll be times you'll get a slide and in the corner it'll just be like destroyed. So it was really devastating because sometimes a really cool sculpture or painting would pop up and be like, oh, my God, I love that. And then it's like, this is the only photo of it because it was burned by Nazis. And it just like a dagger to the heart every time. Boo. Fuck that. Boo, Nazis. Boo. (laughs) So now we're going to go to Paris where this dick fruit invaded France on the 10th of May, 1940. (laughs) After just six short weeks, France surrendered to the Nazis on June 25th, 1940. Now we're in 1941. World War II is raging and Rose Valland was put in paid service and became the overseer of the Jeu de Palme Museum at the time of German occupation in France. My hero Rose was born in... Okay, I got this. <laughs> saint du saint joie Sounds good to me. I'm so sorry, France. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I practiced that. I listened on the Googles and I am pretty sure I still said it wrong. So she was born on November 1st, 1898. She was brilliant and she was very educated on the arts. She earned two degrees from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Lyon and also studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. So she furthered her education with degrees in art history from both the Ecole des Louvre and the Sorbonne. Which, fun fact, I tried to go to the Sorbonne when I was in college, and then I was too poor. <laughs> so I got, I got accepted. I was so excited. I was like, I'm smart enough for the Sorbonne, but I didn't get to go. <laughs> so despite her credentials, Rose began working at the Jeu de Palme Museum in Paris as an unpaid volunteer, a fate known to many historians, <laughs> that you could have 20 degrees and they still don't want to pay you. <laughs> Back to July 1941, the museum's curator, André de Zara, de Zara, French has a wa at it, he <laughs> fell ill and Rose assumed charge of the museum's first. She was a paid attaché and then she became an assistant. So that's like a long time to not be paid, but that's a whole nother thing. And then the Nazis commandeered the Jeu de Palme Museum and converted it into the headquarters of the, oh God, okay, Eisenstadt. Reichsleiter Rosenberg. Hey, I think you nailed that one. <laughs> the Heifweizen Hamburger <laughs> Schlafen. What? Yeah. Eisenstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg. The ERR. We're just going to say that. It was the Nazi art looting organization. Ah. There, they stored the works of art that they had stolen and kind of coordinated where they were going to send it. Rose is quoted as saying, quote, a strange world where works of art arrived with the sound of jackboots, end quote. Hmm. When the Nazis arrived, they forbade any French official to remain at the museum, and they didn't want anybody to witness their highly secret operation, so everybody got fired, except for this unassuming woman assistant curator, and they decided she was allowed to stay. Hmm. By all accounts, they said she was, like, tiny and mousy, and they were like, she's just a dumb woman. She can't even understand us, and blah, blah, blah. So she was allowed to stay. So Jacques Jujard, the director of the Louvre Museum, asked her to keep an eye on them and report everything she saw. Now, can you imagine the amount of bravery? Like, you had the choice. She could have left. She could have left with everybody else and just been like i want to i want to live you know mm-hmm. but she made that decision to become a spy against nazi germany in a nazi occupied country with nazi bosses can, can you hear that that that's the sound <laughs> of her big old brass balls clanking together yes what a <laughs> badass and at this point she had already witnessed what they were doing to priceless works of art she later recalled that quote i saw paintings that were thrown in the louvre like a garbage dump oh. so I imagine that had to have also just been infuriating and painful to see the thing that you love most in the world being thrown around like garbage. Yeah. And one day, a selection of portraits depicting Jewish people had been taken. Paintings who had, to the ERR, no financial value. They lacerated the faces with knives. And in Valon's words, quote, they slaughtered the paintings. Paintings by Miro, I love Miro, Picasso, and so many others. Upwards to 600 paintings were set on fire. 
She described it as, quote, a pyramid where frames crackled in the flames. One could see the faces glaring and then disappearing into the fire. Quote. Oh, that had to hurt to watch. I just had chills thinking about all the masterpieces in the Louvre just being cut and thrown into a fire. Just, ugh, I can't. <laughs> nope. My heart. I, I don't like it. I don't like it either. So as somebody who's dedicated their entire life to art and culture, I imagine she felt compelled to stay and protect it despite the risk and fear because her life was in danger. So our girl is officially a spy. And she also had an advantage. They didn't know she understood German. (laughs) She was able to eavesdrop on all the conversations and she kept detailed notes of not only the artwork, but where it was being taken and which trains were taken at where. She could also decipher the carbon duplicates that they wrote on, and she took pictures of all the photos they brought in. So this, she was good at spying. She she was pissed. I imagine she was just like, I'm going to fuck all you up. (laughs) Like, (laughs) give me that carbon copy. Yeah, I'll file it after I make a copy. And she was taking notes in plain view. Like, she was getting pretty ballsy because she's like, "They, I'm a woman. They're not looking at me. They don't care. I'm going to ensure this art's taken care of. And then she would relay everything to Jujard at the Louvre and the French Resistance. Again, can you imagine how scary it would be to not only spy on a room full of Nazis who were killing people in front of you, uh-huh. but also she had to ensure that they never knew that she understood them. Because if she gave one little inkling that she understood what they said, it was all over. Maintaining that ignorance is is honestly the hardest professionalism in the business. Yeah, I can't even imagine. In the contempt of these people that are destroying something that you love, Mm -hmm. especially when the fuckstick second in the command, Goring, shows up. Uh, And he's all like demanding her to pour him some champagne while he walks around and picks out stuff to steal himself. Yeah. And she has to act like she's not upset, like she doesn't understand what he's saying. And he would walk around like he knew what everything was and would try to tell a history of it. That would be what got me. You know, <laughs> like, if somebody. No, should... And then your cover's blown. <laughs> I know. I'd be like, that is not what happened. <laughs> like, Let just... me tell you something, Mr. Goering. <laughs> yes. How dare you? Ugh, I would. Yeah, that's what it would do. Like, I cannot hide the disgust in my face if somebody mm. did something shitty or said something wrong about art. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so she said it was impossibly hard, but she also said, quote, in this disturbing chaos, the beauty of the safeguarded masterpiece beauty was nonetheless revealed. I belong to them like a hostage. At this point, she was even sleeping there so she could watch all the art coming in and out. Because if she left, she was afraid she'd miss something. Oh, I just, I can't. And there were several occasions where she said guns were pointed at her. And then they would turn and shoot somebody, point them back at her. And she just remained there as calm as possible to be like, I don't know what you're saying. Like, why are you mad, bro? (laughs) But every time they let her go, she had to have been so convincing. I'm impressed. I'm so impressed. And as the allies were getting closer, suspicions and paranoia increased Mm -hmm. and things started going missing because the Nazis were stealing things. Everybody knew it, but she was accused of theft. Four times she was fired and four times she was brought back. (laughs) Can you imagine you got fired? You're like, all right, I lived. They didn't shoot me. And then they call you and they're like, yeah, we need coffee. (laughs) Please come back. No. (laughs) This line, it does not work anymore. Goodbye. Yes. And at one point, she was even accused of sabotage and signaling the enemy. And she was interrogated by the equivalent of the Gestapo. I can English. And then on more than one occasion, Bruno Laus, one of the Germans going put in charge of the Jeu de Pomme, threatened her with execution. She would look him dead in the eye and say, quote, no one here is stupid enough to ignore the risk. Damn. Yeah. What are you going to say to that? Be like, all right. (laughs) He didn't ever shoot her. But there were also some things like she knew he was stealing things. He knew she knew. So it was kind of like a standoff, you know, like he was trying to show force. But she was also like, I can ruin you. And then he would back off. (laughs) After the war, she did learn that they were considering murdering her. She was a very dangerous witness. And they had planned to deport her to Germany to execute her. 
The liberation of Paris by American forces in the late August 1944 placed her in a new precarious position. It's not all great. She possessed enormously valuable information about the fate of tens of thousands of masterworks stolen in all these French collections. But she didn't trust anybody except Jujard at the Louvre. And then, get this, after the liberation, she was incarcerated shortly as a suspected Nazi collaborative. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, wait a minute, let me tell you some things. <laughs> I imagine she's just like, seriously, no. <laughs> but I did not sleep on a floor and get a gun pointed at me <laughs> for you to think I'm on their side. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Luckily, she was released and she didn't hold a grudge. I don't think I would not hold a grudge. I would be very bitter. Definitely would have flipped the bird as I walked away. Yeah. So then this dude, James Rorimer, Roar, oh my God, Rorimer, <laughs> Roar, 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 Rorimer shows up and he's like, hey, I'm a monuments man. You should help me. And she's like, the fuck I do? I don't know you. <laughs> and he works it out. That she knows some important stuff. And he starts building on this relationship. So she'll trust him. Because she's like, mm-hmm. I don't trust anybody but Jouchard. No. It takes yep. months. Months. And he has his uh, memoirs. And he talks about it. About how she just didn't try. So you bring champagne. And they would talk. And eventually she's like, all right, you're good. You know. <laughs> but it took a long time. Yeah. Monuments Men, by the way, were a group of men and women, mainly from Britain and the U.S., responsible for preserving the artistic and cultural achievements of Western civilization from the destruction of war and theft by Nazis. And that's a quote from their website, which is really badass, by the way. Everybody should go to monuments.org. Monumentmen.org. So good. And it's a great movie. If you've not seen that movie, chef's kiss. So they were on the front lines of cultural preservation in the midst of unimaginable destruction. They included museum curators, art historians, artists, librarians, and more. Like architects. Just a lot of people. And they were trying to negotiate with the front lines and the generals to not bomb specific culturally important places, Mm -hmm. uh, museums, churches. (laughs) And they were trying to preserve it because I think... At some point, everybody was realizing that the Nazis were destroying so much of humanity. And what are we without our culture? And if we don't have our art and we don't have our history, what are we? And that would allow them to win because they were trying to erase so much. And so these people were like, not today, bitch. Very true. Not today. (laughs) So the information Rose had risked her life gathering served as a treasure map of sorts for the Monuments Men. And it led to the discovery of multiple repositories of looted art. Most prominently, the, okay, oh, I know this, Neutschwachstein Castle. Oh, man. I should know that one. Neutschwachstein Castle in the Bavarian Alps. It's that really pretty Cinderella Castle like one. I don't know which one you're talking about. Everybody is just goddamn keen right now. <laughs> I should not have said that. Hidden inside the castle were more than 20,000 works of art and cultural objects stolen by the Nazis from private collectors and dealers in France. And thousands of pieces of art were also found in copper mines and salt mines. Ooh, and one time she found out where they were sending this massive shipment of art. Mm -hmm. And she got them to stop the train before it took off and they were able to save everything. Nice. Our girl is a badass. (laughs) So her secretly gathered notes would later be instrumental in expediting the restitution process of returning objects to the rightful owners. That Goring dude, she was like, he's sus, go over there. And they found hundreds of millions of dollars worth of art in his house that he had stolen. And then at the end, about five million objects were returned to their owners. Good. Good. She is incredible. (laughs) So eager to track all the stuff that was stolen, Mm -hmm. she applied for and received a commission into the French First Army on May 4th, 1945, where she became a captain, and she worked really close with the Monuments Men and became a Monuments Woman. Sweet. She became an art representative for the French Commission of Art Recovery. And slightly later, in 1954, she was appointed as a conservator for the French Musée National and the chair of commission for the protection of works of art. She spent the rest of her life advocating for the restitution of art and objects to the rightful owners. In 1968, she did retire, and I put that in quotes because she did not retire, (laughs) and she continued helping the French archives until her death. For her courage and heroic effort, she received the Legion of Honor and Medal of the Resistance. She was also made a commander of the Order of Arts and Letters. In 
1848, the United States gave her the Medal of Freedom. In 1951, she was honored by the Federal Republic of Germany with the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit. And in 1953, she received the long overdue and much deserved title of curator. I feel like that one should not have been the last one, but here we are. (laughs) So Rose Valland passed away in 1980 and is buried in her hometown. Mm -hmm. 70 years on, the work that she began continues. French museums still have some 2,000 stolen works of art that have yet to be claimed. So next time you think of spies and you think James Bond, stop that shit and think (laughs) about Rose Valland. Women are very undersung in the profession. But on one of the walls in one of the classrooms, if anybody ever gets to, in, you know, get recruited and go through Camp Perry, on the wall, it says, only bad spies make history. There have been some amazing female spies through history that you will never know about because they did their jobs so well, like Rose, mm-hmm. that until they're gone, nobody knows their contributions. That's true. And it was really until probably the last decade and a half that people started actually talking about her Mm -hmm. because the monuments men gets a lot of credit you know there's a lot on them but if it wasn't for her i mean hundreds of thousands of works are they would not know who they belong to and they would not have found their rightful owner so a lot of people are really focusing on her now and i think it's just incredible she's so brave and so so spunky and fiery and i just i love that even when the monuments men were like, hey, we're here to help. She's like, no, I don't know you. <laughs> you got to earn my trust, okay? <laughs> it, I mean, she could have been trading one evil for another for all she knew. So, Yeah, exactly. And I do love how she's portrayed. I think it's Kate Blanchett plays her in the movie. But they do show it's Matt Damon playing Rormer. And he's showing up every day with the champagne to talk and they're talking art and he's trying to convince her like i'm the real deal it's what we're doing and and he's just like i'm so close and everybody else is like come on man hurry up we need to know and (laughs) so it's a really good movie and it's probably it's i mean it has bill murray in it and i love him so much and john goodman and oh it's the best movie but i was heartbroken when i was researching this that some people are like monuments men's real i thought it was a movie and i was like oh my god (laughs) no (laughs) it's real it's very real oh it just so many people in the comments were just (laughs) i thought that was fiction i'm like oh god yeah but the avengers was real yeah (laughs) so that hurt my heart she was real and she was more badass than i think any of the books gave her credit for it's not as widely uh, you know talked about how many times she probably almost died and Mm -hmm. uh, just the amount of gumption and coming. I mean, she was like writing notes in front of them. Like she was confident in her skills. <laughs> she was good. Most people would break a little sweat, be a little concerned. She might get caught. And she's like, nope, I'm not going to get caught. Cause if I get caught, this art's gone. All right. So what do you got? I want to fast forward in time just a little bit from your story, but not much to the 1960s. We're at the peak of the Cold War, which for anybody that doesn't know, was a huge standoff between the United States and Russia. Well, technically the Soviet Union at that point in time. We were not allies. We were not friends. And on one hand, you have the CIA, which was, you know, the United States. And then on the opposite team, you have the KGB and... They tried to one-up each other all the time, all the time, all the time, trying to get just either the upper hand or even the underhand or try to flip their spies. I found a story about a guy who worked, he was British, and he worked for nine different intelligence agencies at the same time. So we're not sure whether he was a good guy or a bad guy or a complete liar, but <laughs> in the end, he just disappears off the face of the earth, and wow. it was also a jewel thief. I will try to dig all that up for you for another time. But Operation Acoustic Kitty. (laughs) (laughs) So the I'm sold already. I don't even care what it is. (laughs) The most expensive cat in history might still be alive. I'm not sure how long cats really live. But so in ninth in the the mid sixties, the CIA comes up with this idea that we can use cats as spies. Because technology was not miniaturized like it is now, they, their initial thought was like, well, we can put a microphone 
inside of a cat with oh, an antenna. No. And I looked at the pictures of how they were going to do this, and it was absolutely horrific. And oh. I, I, there's a book written by one of the guys that used to work in scientific research and development, and he talks about how barbaric it was that they couldn't just strap a microphone to a cat and let it run around the park, which, I mean, I think would be cool. I'd go talk to it. i talked talk to all the cats. <laughs> Here, kitty, kitty. So they surgically implanted a battery, a shortwave transmitter or receiver, and a microphone, along with an antenna that ran down the cat's spine and into the tail, and then stitched the cat up. And then the idea was they're going to release the cat. They knew that there was a big park. I think it's part of Central Park that's maybe two blocks away from where the Russian embassy was. Their diplomats would go there, have lunch, chat, bullshit, probably talk about Adidas tracksuits or... Whatever Russians talk about, the, the newest brands of vodka and all of the, you know, what, what, whatever that thing was on Gorbachev's head. I literally really, I think he painted that on every day. That was his beauty mark. But uh, <laughs> so, this cat was going to be the next super spy and be able to just like go sit next to the gentlemen and listen to their conversations and then come back and they would be able to hear it. So they released the cat. It did not have a name. If you research this on your own, you're going to find stories that supposedly the cat jumped out, stopped, did cat things, and then immediately ran into traffic and was killed. Oh, that's, no. not, that's not true. Okay, it's good. not true. I contacted the archivist and he said it's not true. He said the cat ran into the bushes and was never seen again. Oh. So the cat was like, fuck this and yeet it out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeet. <laughs> So we'll move towards the late 60s when they actually can miniaturize things to a certain degree and they can make things smaller. We're going to go across the pond. We're still in the midst of the middle of the Cold War. So the United States and the Soviet Union, they spy on everybody. It doesn't matter if you're friends, if you're foes. I mean, when I when I mentioned this to my pal in MI6, he was he just looked at me like, okay, and he was like check your wall outlets. We might be spying on you too. <laughs> We're not. I checked. <laughs> I, I like how casually you're like my friend and it might say. So about the computer that doesn't want to work tonight, I have an encrypted link so that I can read the archives for all of the Rasputin notes. Uh-huh. They're hilarious, but <laughs> I don't officially have permission to share them yet. So he fucked a lot. They weren't impressed with it. They thought that he stank. He constantly peed out his window and from the little batch of notes that I've read, they've mentioned flatulence probably 300 times. That's in- that's so either, either they're extremely infantile. I mean, uh, they're men. Who isn't? <laughs> Fart jokes are funny. But... All those things don't surprise me. They sound pretty <laughs> on brand. Just the day to day. He's very, he doesn't have a pattern. They had microphones and recording devices in his apartments and he'd be like, I'm going to go get bread. And then he would run off and get drunk. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but there was nobody in the apartment, Rasputin, so either you know or you're just crazy. Yeah, or yeah, or both. <laughs> like, let's not count that out. <laughs> <laughs> so the Soviets, being Soviets, decided that they were gonna bug the Dutch embassy in the, the late say the early sixties. And the ambassador Henry Held, Henry, Henri? I'm not sure Henry. how they pronounce that. <laughs> it's Henry with an I, so I think it's Henri Held. He's working in his office one day. He has two pet Siamese cats that are asleep on his desk when all of a sudden both of them get up, go ape shit, and start scratching at a spot in the wall. And he's like, okay, they heard a mouse. So he goes over towards the wall and the cats will just not leave this spot the fuck alone. They're scratching at it so much that they actually damage the paper and they're freaking out. And then almost as soon as it started, they stop. Act like cats. I'm sure one licked its butt and the other one smacked the other one in the face. (laughs) They go back up on the desk. So this happens three times and it's always within the first 15 minutes of the hour. So he contacts an engineer in the embassy. They come, they check the wall because if there is a mouse and it dies, then I mean, nobody wants to smell that while you're working. Even in the sixties, I don't even know if they had computers, (laughs) but he's on his rotary telephone trying to talk dirty to his wife. He's like, Ooh, what's that smell? So what, what they find is a microphone that's activated by radio uh, radio signals. Oh. The cats and their hearing was so good that they could hear the radio signal and they could hear the microphone turning on and turning off. Oh, okay. So rather than take the microphone out, they start to have secret, you know, top secret, finger quote, conversations in front of the microphone. I mean, they're really leading the Soviets on. I'm sure the Soviets are just like, man, we've really got them now. <laughs> and then they stop. 
But two weeks later, a secretary stops in and complains that the sewer pipes that were supposed to be fixed coming into the building, but they haven't been fixed because work keeps getting delayed. The very next day, there is a mysterious team out there fixing the sewer pipes. Oh, so. <laughs> that's a little suspicious. <laughs> so after that, because nothing really interesting goes on in Holland, are the Dutch the Netherlands or are they Holland? <sighs> At the Dutch embassy, nothing interesting goes on. <laughs> I, I apologize to anybody that's European. I spent enough time there, but I have a traumatic brain injury, so sometimes things just don't add up. And they don't. They will not come out the mouth hole. So rather than remove any of the microphones they found, they just ignore them because you never know when you'll need another, uh, you know, repair done. I Googled it. Yeah, it is nation native to the Netherlands. The okay. Dutch. I thought that's good. So when everybody thinks of spies, the first one that pops to mind is James Bond. Do you know who gave the inspiration for to Ian Fleming for James Bond? I feel like I've heard it at some point, but I do not. So John D was a spy for Elizabeth the first. And he used his knowledge of alchemy and philosophy as a cover to spy for conspiracy plots against the queen. Cool. After the Pope declared her illegitimate. I think he found like 30 to 40 plots to kill her and they foiled every single one. So, I mean, that, oh, alone, that, that foil factory was, it was rolling. Oh, hell he yeah. claimed to speak to angels and signed all his letters to Elizabeth, 007, and he was the inspiration for Ian Fleming's character in James Bond. Okay, I don't think I knew that because that's really badass. <laughs> I have some other little nuggets. In the James Bond movie Goldfinger, Bond is, is in a famous scene emerging from scuba diving. So he comes up from the shore and he peels out of his wetsuit. And he's got a tuxedo underneath. So Peter Tazlar was a Dutch spy. See how I brought all that back together? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do anything fun after World War II. So he used that technique to get into Nazi control when you know, Nazis, boo. Uh, they controlled the Netherlands for most of World War II. Mm-hmm. So the exile queen, Queen Wilhelmina, told him to slip in and bring out two colleagues, Eric Hazelhoff. Hazelfly, I can't read my own notes. This is great. Eric Hazelhoff, Rolf Zolema, Zema, Rolf Zema, <laughs> and Bob Vanderstock. I love Dutch names. It's all like Van der Flop and <laughs> Von Sandwich. And so they were also spies that were still there undercover. They were supposed, he was supposed to sneak them out of the country back to Britain where the queen was in exile. Several times they try to insert him, but the weather is bad and the sea is rough, but they finally get him in and he's met on the beach by Rolf Zemo, who <laughs> pours a flask of Hennessy over the top of him after he strips out into the tuxedo pours this over the top of him so when he meets the sentries on the beach they're just a pair of very drunk very from what i read they were they were very lovey of each other but the smell was enough to put them off so he gets to sneak into the country ultimately he's not successful getting his comrades out and he has to escape on his own oh a good try though (laughs) yeah i mean it worked so Ian Fleming used a lot of these stories that were told in, in the, the intelligence community afterwards to, to kind of piece together the, you know, things from the Bond movies. You see stuff like underwater cars, and that was not entirely unrealistic. I know the CIA tested an underwater car, and it kind of like, it's still on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay because they got oh. it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that the KGB trains squirrels to steal things? No, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine how hard that training was. You can't get cats to do what you want. Try to get a squirrel to do it. They're very crafty. I I can't imagine. Secret agent squirrel. Secret <laughs> agent squirrel. The CIA trained dolphins as assassins, and that program is still being used and developed by the U.S. Navy. They <laughs> use lions to detect bombs. How... Flipper became an assassin. They're just like, here's your knife. Go stab somebody. Goes and stabs his trainer like, fuck you, motherfucker. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> dolphins are terrifying. The internet has ruined me. I used to think they were so wonderful until the internet enlightened me to just how murderous they are. Apparently, they will seek out puffer fish and then poke them with their nose because the toxin gets them high. It's like, I used to think dolphins were kind of like, you know, they were cute. And you read about them and, and they're... There are lots. We don't know how smart they are because they keep throwing a test. It's true. Porpoisely. <laughs> Did it's, you say porpoisely? Porpoisely, yes. 
So I do want to say the CIA does not have a secret flock of 10,000 pigeons that are secretly drones. And if they did, they still wouldn't let me use them. So. <laughs> That's why you know that, because you asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm research and development, scientific research and development hates me because I will request like a hundred of everything and just <laughs> the most random things, empty Starbucks containers. I requested 20 ostriches once and they were like, why do you need 20 ostriches? I was like, I could tell you, but I'd have to read you in on the operation. And they were just like, no, we don't have 20 ostriches. Said, can I get five? Uh, you can get <laughs> one. And then the next day, I didn't realize that down the street, they were moving as like a private zoo. They were rescuing the animals. There's an ostrich in a cage. And I was like, yes, yes, I got my ostrich. <laughs> Nobody in my office knew why I was so happy. I ran to the window and I was pounding on the window like, it's my ostrich. Wow. I'm really shocked there is an ostrich spice because they're kind of mean. They like, are. That you could ride that into battle and probably win. They a are. story for a time that we're not on the air. I will happily <laughs> share with you. <laughs> ostrich is completely fucked in operation. So. Oh, amazing. Yeah, we went to that drive through safari down here at the Natural Bridge, and the ostrich just stuck its whole ass head in there and was just like, mine. And it took our little guide, and it took my mother-in-law's stuff. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> ah, they're thieves. It's terrible. Yeah, and then she was like trying to feed it, but it kept getting her finger, and she'd be like, ow. It was fun. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> when I first moved to Texas, I was 15. I fell in with the wrong people and there was an emu farm right down the road from the school. And since I'm not sure what I did, but my car got taken away for a week. So I had to walk home. I was like, I don't want to go home. So I was walking home with a friend and he's like, you want to let the emus out? <laughs> yes. <let's do> this. <laughs> people would stop and feed them. So as soon as you get over by the fence, over by the gate, they immediately come over. As soon as you open that gate, they just, it was pandemonium. Oh, they're like little dinosaurs. Thank they you. are. They're freaking run. And they, they don't listen. Mm. I thought they would just like mill alongside. No, they ran up the street. They ran down the street. They ran into the school because people were coming out. People <laughs> pulled the doors open for them. I had to do 3,000 hours of community service and personally apologize to every single bird. It was embarrassing i have heard the pigeon thing i'm really sad that that's not real that just sounds hilarious i'm, I'm not confirming or denying that there are you know birds are not real uh, <laughs> if my girlfriend julie ever listens to this birds are definitely not real so <laughs> <laughs> what is it that they're all robots and that they recharge themselves by sitting on the their drones they recharge themselves by sitting on on wires which doesn't work because it's the wrong kind of current that goes through with them <laughs> <laughs> this is stuff in in scientific research that's scary in the military they openly use a very small form of drone that looks like a dragonfly but it's oh. only about nine minutes of flight time so you could stop pop it out turn it on fly it in a window get one you know like a quick picture of the inside of the building and then zip back out and then the entry team knows exactly what's on each floor Ooh. and nobody's gonna think about a dragonfly no not at all they're very unassuming. Very. Yeah. The intelligence community is great because when you meet people, they either think everything is Jason Bourne and James Bond, or they think we're all idiotic drunks like Archer. I love that show. Oh, but I love Archer. <laughs> <laughs> How similar is your life to Archer? That's my real question. Because when you're talking about the, the cat, I was like, that's an episode of Archer in the future. <laughs> it has to be. It just has to be. There, there's some parallels in there. <laughs> Definitely. Or like the KGB stuff. I was like, oh, yeah. Sterling Archer. Yeah, I'm friends with a whole bunch of people in the F. Well, the KGB used to be something else, and that became the KGB, and that was the FSV. And when I was in ISA, we liaised with all of the other intelligence agencies. So I've got probably eight or nine Russians that live in the United States that actively work for the FSV. So yeah, they're here. And they're fascinating to talk to that, like, in the 80s, they would... One of the gentlemen that I talked to, his name is Sergey, and like when I, I want to play a Russian for whatever reason, I always steal his name because he's fun. <laughs> but he was like, "You Americans, you will not understand of of mission in country. My parents are are how you say they sleep. They they sleep much. They sleep twenty years. They wake up. <laughs> 
they wake up from Mother Russia and they say, Mother, what are we doing? And they said, you must live life until we give you phone call. <laughs> and one day, my mother from Mother Russia, she she sleep much. She's much the sleep, yes? She she get the call and it says, we've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> <laughs> And this whole time, I, I thought he was serious, and he was gonna like let me in on some serious, deep, like deep dive stuff. And it's it's a fucking it's a car warranty joke, you oh. asshole. <laughs> it's like the Rick Roll of our time. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't understand Rick Rolls. I send him to him all the time. He's like, it's good song. It's 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 very catchy. I play it in car. People look at me like I am crazy. Like, uh, you're a big Russian dude. Everybody's gonna look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Oh, one of my best friends for the longest time thought it was, I'm always going to give you up. I'm always going to let you down. And I was like, well, that's a really depressing song. That your whole life, you thought this was really just a bummer, huh? If you ever want to hear misunderstood song lyrics, definitely listen to it sung in a different in a different country's national voice. Oh, things yeah. Things don't always translate properly. And if, one of the biggest problems that they had during World War II was if the French sent information to whoever was closest, then they had to translate it into their language. And English and American don't always coincide. Like, for the longest time, I thought a water closet, like literally they had a sink in the back. Like, <laughs> in there and there's constantly running water. Like why? And they're talking about putting things in their boots. And it's like, I keep a knife in my boot. I mean, I still do today, but why? And they're like, no, the, the, and they point at the hood of the car, and they're like, that's the, the, the boot. Like, no, that's the hood. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. I went to Ireland, and fun words, like the loo and the cue <laughs> and the lift. And I was like, I'm learning things. I found cool. out after my mom's mom passed away that one of her aunts is Baroness. Oh. In Ireland, she has, like, an old shitty castle, and she lives in a little thatched roof hut next to it. But it was... I got to meet her when I was I was overseas. I flew over and she was she knows the history of the island and she knows all of the the lore. It was it was, it was fascinating. Oh, that's it was cool. Really amazing. And my one of my dad's dad's uncles was the Duke of Athol, and that's how I got my commission in Her Majesty's Royal Highlanders. What? How? How are you how are you you? <laughs> Nobody has this experience. I, I have had a very, I either have like a million four leaf clovers in my butt or like a whole bunch of rabbit's feet. I explain why I have gas all the time, but. <laughs> How do you not have a novel or like a TV show about yourself at this because point? You nobody, need to... I sit around with some of the older guys that, you know, were spies during the Cold War and, and they tell stories and then our guys will tell stories and they just look at us and they're like, that's not true. That's, that's a movie. Is the problem is <laughs> nobody believes you, and you can't support a lot of the documentation that this stuff happened unless you were there and you know. So you need to make maybe like a graphic novel or something, and that way you can. I, I could, I could do that. Present it as fiction. And yeah, so a little bit, but you'll know. You'll know it's true. My yeah. friend Belford says, "Tell them how you stick things in your butt." <laughs> okay. I don't know if he's listening or watching, but the joke for the longest time when I, I finally, you know, had the big reveal with him because he's stationed at, I think, Lackland. Hmm. He's somewhere in San Antonio. Yeah, Lackland's where they do the training for special forces. I had come down. I was still, I was reserved, but I was, I, I was active contracting. So I had gone over there to help work with the security forces mm -hmm. as op for for something. And he was security. He was, he trains SF. So he was like, what are you doing here? Because I had on civilian clothes and, and, you know, I had all my gear thrown over my shoulder. And I'm like, oh, I'm your op for for the day. He's like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> he was like, so do you have like a 240 up your butt or something? Like, what would you like to know? <laughs> but the, the running joke was, you know, if you're a spy, you have to learn how to hide things and stick things in your butt. And it's like, so when I went to my first advanced class at Camp Perry, where, it's where they train field agents in, in Virginia, the instructor comes in and he's he's very, very stern. He almost looks like Archer, but he's got silver hair. And he he gives you the rundown of his history that he was Operation Phoenix in Vietnam. And then he did like deep cover in Russia and Bulgaria. And he's just, you're, you're like, oh, you're a total badass. 
And he's like, all right, so this class is not about how to hide things in your butt. And then he flips over his little board thing and it says rectal concealment. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're going to have to teach that class, you better have fun with it. Oh, he did. He did. He had a whole bunch of objects on a table and he was like, you may not think it, but every object on this table can fit in your butt. Wow. Like, hmm. Yeah. I can, say, I can say honestly that in my career, I have not had to use that route. But I, I <laughs> when I was stationed in Africa, I didn't wear socks, but I had bands and I had an insole in them because my feet were, I just, I don't like the way their, their insoles are. But we would hide money and documents and stuff in, in, I would take the gel insole and cut the heel and then slide everything in a little plastic oh. packet. So it was in case things, you know, shit hits the fan situation. We had money. We had documents. I'm sure a lot of guys walked out of the room. They were just kind of like, like, I know where you're hiding yours. <laughs> like, you know, you don't have to do that every day, right? Oh. <laughs> I can't tell you the joy of knowing that there's an entire class about rectal concealment. Is that uh, information I didn't know I needed, but they will pass around uh, in the sixties. They developed a rectal toolkit and it's about the size of your average Easter egg. Only it's oh. not nearly as pointed on the top, which would probably make things a little bit easier, but they, they pass it around so you can open it up and you can look at it. And then, and then after everybody in the class has physically touched it, he says that it was actually used in the field. Like, <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> uh. Oh, that's funny. I'm sure He's, he has a lot he got of jokes. <laughs> we have a class where they teach you the different levels of soft body armor that you can wear and still like still be concealable under the clothes. So they make a three that's Kevlar level three. It'll stop most it won't stop a rifle or shotgun, but it'll stop most handgun rounds. And I very foolishly volunteered to be the test. Oh no. So they have a Cold War like a Makarov. It's just a, a little nine millimeter pistol. It's standard issue in Russia. It's it's very low powered round. I put the vest on and then I put the suit on. And I, I was I'm he, the instructor was like, go stand over there by the table. And he pulls out a freaking Glock forty and shoots me in the chest and knocked me on my ass and I could not breathe for however long. He just leans over. He's like, you all right, champ? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> he's like, you gonna tell jokes in my class ever again? Wow. I, I, I told so many jokes, but <laughs> <laughs> wow. everybody has, it's kind of like the, the, if you're issued a taser, you have to get shot with the taser. So, you know, everybody that's a field agent has been shot at least once. Okay. Okay. Man, how are you so cool? I don't know. I I'm just... the biggest dork you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe I got you on this episode. You actually know like <laughs> legit spy shit. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. This was such Thank a good you episode. You were too cool <laughs> to be on this podcast. I don't know what happened and how you got here, but I'm so glad you did. <laughs> you can blame Lucy. Yes, I will. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> I want to thank my guest again, Nicholas, for joining me for this episode. I had such a great time. And how did I get so lucky to get a real life spy on the spy episode? So thank you again for joining me, Nick. If you like to watch this full episode that is completely blooper filled and has lots of deleted scenes, go to patreon.com slash historical AF pod. There's also a ton of other benefits you can check out. And I'm adding a new goal because listen, my computer, she tired. She's so tired. I need a new one. So if you join Patreon, you're going to help me have new equipment so I can make this podcast better, new software, all that. So, you know, help a girl out. If you'd like to send a story in for the listeners episode, that's historical AF pod at gmail.com. I want to hear about your scary hometown stories. You have family history, your favorite historical nuggets. Just let me know. Again, that's historicalafpod at gmail.com. You can follow me on social media. That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at historicalafpod. And be sure to follow social media for when there's specials on merch. And speaking of merch, that is shop.spreadshirt.com slash historicalafpod. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Join me next week. I have special guest Encyclopedia Obscura for Spies Part 2. Okay, bye.